Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, good morning friends so today we are going to take up the third unit of the first section that is speaking about the sociological analysis of sociological analysis of rural phenomenon so i think uh, when we try to speak about the sociological analysis of the rural phenomenon i think the basic understanding is that it tries to speak about a uh, scientific interpretation of the rural phenomenon i think uh, when we try to speak about that i think uh, we have spoken about in the previous discussion that what were the various theoretical and the methodological issues which are involved and which makes this rural sociology as a specialized discipline in terms of understanding about the rural society so when we try to speak about the sociological analysis it may involve a battery of concepts which are to be used and uh, these concepts are seen as the eye opener or they are basically seen as what one can say that when we want to enter into the world of rural then we have to have the understanding about these concepts so these concepts have been used in terms of a specific theory or sometimes they are been used in terms of understanding a specific phenomenon which is with regard to the indian society so these concepts i think are the part and parcel of rural sociology and the concepts are been talked about and dealt by the various sociologists and social anthropologists and if i name a few concepts so the concepts that comes in our mind are the concept of little community that is one prominent concept then we also speak about the concept of the folk urban continuum and we also speak about the concept of dominant caste and also we try to speak about the jajmani system and we also have an important concept of sanskritization so friends these are the battery of concepts i am not saying that uh, these are the only concepts there are other uh, little and the smaller and the Uh, different concepts are there which are been used in a specific sense but i think uh, keeping in view the structuring of this unit uh, we can have the understanding about these concept so that we can have a better understanding about how we try to see the rural uh, processes in terms of our sociological interpretation and most of the terms which we try to see which has been talked about i think uh, they are basically been talked about by specific scholars like if you try to speak about the concept of little community it has been spoken about by robert redfield if you try to speak about four carbon continuum four carbon continuum also has been spoken about by robert redfield with regard to the specific setting the dominant caste which has been used by professor m n srinivas then the jajmani system it has a bearing from various scholars but especially we try to see the contribution of wiser w h wiser who is uh, instrumental in defining and understanding the hindu jajmani system and then also we have the concept of sanskritization which basically speaks about the changeology in the caste system so this is again given by m n shrinivas i think apart from that we can have battery of other concepts like speaking about universalization 
और पेरिकुलाइजेशन विच हैज बीन टॉक्ड अबाउट बाय मैके मेरियट so i think uh, uh, we can keep on going uh, dealing with these concepts but i think to be more focused uh, let us try to tackle the first five concepts that we have tried to spoke about especially when we try to see the understanding about the little community the important thing that comes in our mind is that the little community is to be seen in a specific sense and this is basically a significant work which has been talked about by robert redfield that is on present society and culture present society and culture by robert redfield where he is trying to understand that how we can have the understanding about the meaning of the little community or what one can say will be a little community and somewhere we also try to see that can we see village as a little community so can we see village as a little community that is going to be an instrumental thing uh, so that we can have a better understanding about what the villages are and to in order to understand this little community robert redfield has spoken about in terms of the four characteristics especially if he tries to see that what were the four characteristics that he was referring to he was talking about the little community in terms of smallness then he was trying to see it in terms of distinctiveness then we have the element of homogeneity and we also have the issue of self sufficiency so i think uh, these are the four characteristics which marks any entity to be seen in terms of the little community and here the basic understanding is that it tries to understand the village as a little community now when we try to speak about the issue of smallness so smallness in terms of what basically we try to see that smallness is to be seen in terms of the so called uh, face to face interaction face to face interaction so the smallness is to be seen in such a fashion that the people are knowing about each other in a face to face situation and more than that i think it speaks about also the geographical limitation in terms of the territory in terms of uh, uh, what you can say the area and also the smallness is to be seen in terms of that the people are accessible to each other in day to day affairs so that is the idea of smallness so village as we try to see that village is normally marked by the smallness because the understanding is that people in a village they know about each other they know about the inhabitants they know about the uh, rural settlement the location in that sense and also they try to understand that who are the people who belong to this particular village so smallness is to be seen in terms of the physical proximity in terms of the face to face interaction in terms of the informal relationships so i think uh, that is the notion of smallness uh, which we try to see and that represents uh, how village can be seen as a little community and that of course is an important characteristics of a village then second important characteristics uh, which is going to be uh, more relevant is trying to speak about the notion of distinctiveness now distinctiveness with that we mean to say that uh, we are trying to speak about that how the community has to be visualized and the basic understanding is that the people should know that where the community begins and where it ends so the people the population of that particular setting should be in a position to understand that what is the uh, what are the limits of the community that is we try to see it in terms of either the field in terms of the house which is the last house which is the starting house which is the last field which is the first field in that sense so we try to see that this distinctiveness is to be seen in terms of the physical separation of that particular entity from 
the other neighboring units. And in that way, if you try to see, we try to find out that this distinctiveness is very crucial because when the people are in interaction, they should know that who is a stranger in their village. Even the person coming from the neighborhood village can easily be identified. So, the basic idea in that sense of course is that the distinctiveness is to be seen in terms of that the people are well aware about their boundaries, well aware about the population, the people, the inhabitants and also they are well aware about that what are the jurisdiction in which they have to work. So, distinctiveness is to be seen in that fashion and the village definitely is a marker of that when we try to speak about in terms of the distinctiveness. Then the third crucial thing which comes into existence is the idea of homogeneity. And this homogeneity basically we try to see is to be seen in terms of the various activities and the state of mind, activities and the state of mind uh, which are to be seen in terms of uh, having certain amount of relationship, having some certain amount of uh, similarities especially in terms of the age, in terms of the sex or in terms of the positions. So, we try to see there are similarities which are there and these things are basically passing from generation to generation. They are basically passing from generation to generation. So, we try to see that there is certain amount of patterning of the village life. The basic idea is that the people are or they should be in a better position to understand that this homogeneity has to be marked in terms of the occupation, in terms of the dress, in terms of the food habits or we try to see even in terms of the special language or basically we try to see it in terms of the local dialect or even if you try to see the homogeneity in terms of the celebration of the festivals and the fairs, celebration of the festivals and the fairs. So, when we try to speak about these things, the important thing that comes out is that this homogeneity basically tries to cut across the different sections of the society. It makes the uniformity which is spread across the village and we try to see this homogeneity is also marked in terms of having the sort of solidarity because this homogeneity may result into the bigger solidarity. So, we try to see that why village are seen as the uh, uh, what you can say the solidified units and one basic reason for that is that we if we have the homogeneity the element of similarity is going to come and that will bring about certain amount of unity in the village. So, unity definitely has some linkage with the homogeneity, maybe in terms of laws, in terms of implications, in terms of the process, in terms of the uh, forces of change or in terms of the specific interventions which are going to take place. So, we try to see that homogeneity is a distinctive character of uh, the little community which has been talked about by Robert Redfield. And finally, we try to see the basic idea of self-sufficiency. Now, when we try to speak about the self-sufficiency, the important thing uh, which we try to see uh, as a uh, what you can say a phrase or as a rider of self-sufficiency is that the village is seen as a cradle to the grave arrangement. And when we try to speak about that, the basic understanding is that uh, uh, this cradle to grave arrangement basically speaks about the fact that the basic needs of the people, uh, the population in the rural setting that are going to be fulfilled by the understanding of uh, uh, what you can say uh, the idea of the uh, people in terms of their day to day requirements. And when we try to speak about the cradle to grave arrangements, it basically speaks about the fact that village are to be seen as the closed unit. Now, I think uh, when we say that uh, this is basically the village setting in terms of a little community and which are to be seen as the isolated whole. So, that basically speaks about that uh, the 
villages in terms of little community are having the limited interaction with the surrounding. And in that way when we try to speak about that, we basically also try to see that uh, this understanding tries to have uh, the village in terms of the atomistic unit, which have its own uh, arrangements, which have its own uh, adjustment and the specific uh, what you can say the measures which are to be uh, important for the governance of the society. Now this self-sufficiency uh, definitely speaks about uh, uh, one form of uh, understanding of the little community and that way if you try to see all these characteristics we somewhere try to locate that village how it can be seen as a little community. Uh, but this particular study or the contribution of this concept from Robert Redfield has been put critically uh, by various scholars and in the Indian context if you try to see uh, it was basically the B. R. Chauhan's contribution who tries to criticize uh, the understanding of little community and in one of his famous work that is a Rajasthan village, a Rajasthan village and the name of the village is Rana Vatuki Sadri. So, in this village Rana Vatuki Sadri basically uh, B. R. Chauhan was speaking about uh, the uh, what you can say understanding of the little community and uh, there he tries to see that uh, there are certain commonality which are been seen and has been discussed by Robert Redfield especially the question of the smallness that was quite visible with regard to the village even in terms of distinctiveness also uh, we try to see that there were certain amount of arrangements uh, which has been there people were knowing about their boundaries, they were clear about uh, the worship of a specific de deity, uh, the local deity in that sense as such and people were uh, what you can say in relation to that particular deity. So that distinctiveness of that village was been represented through the specific worship of a deity, the local deity and that make it distinct from the other villages. And also in terms of homogeneity, although there were some variations which has been reflected uh, by B. R. Chauhan, but uh, apart from that for all practical reasons certain amount of homogeneity was been visible when we try to see the village Ranavatuki Sadri in terms of the homogeneity. But the point is that when we try to speak about the last element that is the self-sufficiency. So when we try to see village in terms of a little community having an element of self-sufficiency, we try to find out that this understanding uh, has some limitation because when we try to speak about we try to find out that uh, this self-sufficiency has to be seen in terms of the fact that when we have the marriages. So for the marriages and as we know that the villages are normally marked by the village exogamy. So if we have the village exogamy, so then how we can speak about uh, the question of the closed unit how we can speak about the self-sufficiency because for the uh, marriage purpose the brides are to be brought from the outside village and if that happens self-sufficiency of the village is broken. So we try to see the notion of uh, the village exogamy in terms of marriage is going to break the arrangement and apart from that we also try to see that this self-sufficiency can also be broken when we try to see it in terms of economy. Like uh, the village can be the producers of many things, but especially when we try to speak about certain items like the spices or we try to speak about uh, uh, certain other arrangements in terms of the finished goods. For that, we try to find out that uh, the villagers have to depend upon the outside uh, setting. And in that way, we try to find out that the element of uh, self-sufficiency in terms of the economy, in terms of the production of certain items are restricted and the village has the linkage with the outside setting. So we try to see that uh, uh, this understanding sometimes although have some limitation, but still for understanding the village as a little community makes some sense and that way we can relate the idea of little community to the village 
so that we can have a better understanding about the village setting. Now moving down to another important concept that is speaking about the folk urban continuum and that has been spoken by Robert Redfield especially he was speaking about a life in a Mexican village life in a Mexican village and the name of the village was Tepaslon uh, which is basically seen in terms of uh, an understanding about uh, uh, the village in continuity with the outside world. Now here uh, when we try to speak about the folk urban continuum uh, by Robert Redfield in the analysis of the Mexican village and uh, I think when we try to see this understanding uh, we try to find out that uh, uh, people like Oscar Lewis also has spoken about the relationship between the folk urban continuum that is the linkage between the Mexican village and the Indian village which he tried to study and which was basically an outcome of the comparative analysis of uh, the setting. So he also was trying to focus upon this issue of the folk urban continuum uh, but speaking practically about Robert Redfield contribution in terms of uh, the folk urban analysis we try to find out that uh, was uh, it was basically the idea of folk which was important for Robert Redfield. So when we try to see the folk urban continuum although we try to see that how folk urban continuum can be seen we basically try to see that the folk urban continu continuum are to be seen in terms of understanding the relationship that is there between the rural and the urban and uh, when we try to see the contribution of uh, Robert Redfield. Uh, he was basically trying to uh, study the Chencom village, Chencom village uh, which was basically seen as uh, the village where he was trying to uh, locate the understanding of folk. And this folk is basically uh, which is basically uh, the part of uh, analysis that how folk has to be visualized. So one thing which we can see is that uh, when this notion of folk urban continuum was been discussed in the interpretation and analysis of that Robert Redfield was lesser speaking about the notion of urban and he was talking more about uh, looking to the folk society as the ideal society, folk society as the ideal society in his whole analysis uh, he was giving more focus on the folk society as and in contrast to that he says that what is opposite to this is urban. So what is not folk is urban that is how he was trying to uh, have the relationship and this mental construct was basically seen as uh, been created by uh, Robert Redfield in terms of analysis of the folk society. Now for us the important question is that how we try to see that folk as a type of society, folk as a type of society and here we try to find out that this society is basically marked by certain characteristics that what type of society is? It is such a society, it is such a society uh, which is small, isolated, then non-literate and also we have the element of homogeneous structure, homogeneous with regard to the sense of social solidarity. So we have the uh, non-literate component and we have the homogeneity in terms of uh, what one can say the sense of solidarity and this is basically leading to the specific coherent structure which we try to see in terms of uh, what one can say the basic idea of the culture. So the folk in that sense has been marked by the element of a specific culture uh, which is unique in its own way and what is more important in the society is that the kinship relationship, 
are going to be prime and basically we try to see that the familial groups are seen as the unit of interaction familial group are seen as the unit of interaction that is what makes us to the understanding of uh, the folk and beyond that if you try to see further we try to see that there is an element of sacred the element of sacred is there uh, which is over and above the so called secular and uh, we try to see that uh, uh, this uh, society has the economy uh, which is not to be seen in relation to the market but to some extent we try to see that there is certain amount of sacredness which is prevailed and the the economy of the status is to be seen uh, in terms of having certain amount of uh, exchanges uh, which are going to be important aspect when we try to speak about the understanding about the folk society now ratfield was basically concerned about uh, uh, the folk pole of the continuum the folk pole of the continuum uh, where he was trying to speak about that uh, something which is not there in urban is going to be representing the uh, folk pole and this is how he was trying to make a linkage uh, with regard to the urban so we have on the one end the folk pole and on the other side we try to see that we have the urbanized now that urbanized urban society is to be seen in terms of an ideal type again which has the due representation of the market and uh, when he was trying to speak about these issues the important thing is that the folk urban continuum the folk urban continuum which has been talked about by him was basically an extension of uh, the dichotomy which has been raised by people like mene then we have tonies and emel darkheim so the contribution in terms of the dichotomy by these peoples uh, were considered to be important and uh, robert redfield also was trying to hint about that we can see the folk and urban continuum in terms of the specific dichotomy that on the one side we have uh, the folk and the, on the other side we have the urban now what can be the possible characteristics of urban the urban in that sense has to be seen as having certain amount of uh, uh, what you can say uh, secularization that is going to be an important element because the society has to be marked by the uh, so called secularization and there is also to some extent uh, we have the sort of disorganization of culture disorganization of culture uh, which is going to be important and beyond that uh, we try to see that the level of individualization has to be seen individualization has to be seen uh, which is going to be crucial when we try to see that uh, in terms of uh, the uh, arrangements in terms of the people's understanding we try to see that uh, the element of heterogeneity is going to dominate the element of heterogeneity is going to dominate and we try to see that this heterogeneity individualization is going to uh, be spoken in terms of uh, what one can say speaking about the urban now when we try to see that how there is a exchange which is there between the folk and the urban we basically try to find out that uh, the folk is basically seen as one polar end and it has its linkage with the urban in terms of uh, maybe speaking about the market economy or we try to see that uh, we try to have an understanding in terms of uh, certain amount of uh, uh, migration which is going to take place and that basically see the connect which has to be seen uh, with regard to the understanding about uh, the four uh, urban in terms of a specific setting and we try to find out that uh, there is certain element of uh, the folk urban progression which is going to take place folk urban progression which is going to take place and here we try to see that how the two elements are going to have the exchange basically when we try to speak about uh, the sort of relationship 
I think folk society is been marked by the uh, what you can say the practices of agriculture and the allied activities. But uh, urban, if you try to see, has the different criteria, and we basically try to see that when we have the sort of exchanges in terms of the market economy, we try to see that uh, the people are moving or exchanging the good in terms of uh, this particular society. Now, one important thing that comes to our mind is that uh, when we have uh, uh, the so-called pure folk, I think uh, as he has referred earlier that uh, the folk has to be seen in terms of uh, the specific arrangement uh, which is seen as an ideal type. But then again the ideal type cannot be localized in a specific setting. So, what is to be understood is that uh, there is no pure folk in that sense and we basically try to see that this pure folk in that sense is not going to be uh, clear cut uh, available in the existing reality and it has its linkage with the urban. Similarly, we also try to find out that when we try to speak about the relationship, we try to see that uh, uh, these arrangements are to be seen in terms of the continuity. And what is this continuity? Basically, the continuity is seen in terms of the exchanges which are going to take place. Like when we try to speak about uh, the folk pole and on the other we have the urban pole. So, how we try to see the linkage? We basically try to see that uh, on the one extreme there is one type of one, one polarity and on the other we have the urban polarity. Now, these two are having the linkage. It is not that uh, the folk is completely in isolation and the urban also has its bearing with the rest of the world. So, we try to see that uh, uh, how the folk urban continuum has to be seen in terms of uh, the linkage. We basically try to see in either of the way like we try to see the shift or the directionality of the folk which is basically uh, moving from the folk to the urban pole. Now, let us say if you try to have different uh, understanding, let us say we are talking about the three entities, three uh, settings, the three uh, concentrations uh, in terms of A, B and C and we try to find out that this A, B and C how we try to represent them in this folk urban continuum. So, we say that uh, like A if you try to speak about the A then we try to say that uh, the folk pole uh, and the urban pole they are basically the two extremes and A is located at uh, the midpoint right. So, the A may be having the elements of both the folk and the urban and in terms of exchanges also we try to see certain bearings of uh, the urban are going to be there when we try to speak about the A. But A in that sense is going to be C as having the mix of the two uh, in terms of the representation. But if you try to move towards the B, so the B basically if you try to see, uh, we try to find out that uh, B is closer to urban pole and if that is true, then we try to see that the B will have more elements of urban as compared to A or as compared to the folk pole. So, we try to see that B has the more concentration of uh, the urban, it has uh, more understanding about uh, the urban as compared to A. And then when we try to speak about the C, the third category, then we try to see that okay, C is more rural, it is more fo folk as compared to the other two. Now, these things are to be seen in terms of continuum, in terms of the linkage, in terms of the relationship and what is going to be important is that <coughs> on the basis of that we may try to have certain amount of labeling like we can say that uh, when we try to speak about uh, B, we can see it as a small town or when we try to see A, we try to see it in terms of a specific kasbah. And when we try to see uh, C, then we can call it as a small village. So, I think uh, we try to see that this transition speaks about that we cannot have the 100 percent of urban and we cannot have the 100 percent of rural. So, we have to see in terms of degree, in terms of the relativity. So, we have to see the folk urban in terms of certain amount of uh, relative understanding 
it has not to be seen in terms of an idealistic situation that this represents the folk and this represents the urban. Because even in the urban also, we may have number of variations, we may speak about the town, we may speak about the city and now we may speak about the mega city. So, we may keep on continuing in classification of the city towards the urban side and in the folk side also we can have the village, we can have the big village, uh, we can have the uh, uh, new villages which are going to be modern villages in that sense as such. So, I think uh, both the extremes if you try to see they are not representing the homogeneous component, but they are basically trying to speak about uh, certain amount of uh, bearing of either the folk or the urban and that tries to give a color to the understanding of the uh, folk urban continuum. Now, moving down to the uh, another concept that is trying to speak about the concept of dominant caste. Now, dominant caste as we try to see uh, basically the concept of dominant caste as I shared earlier that it has been talked about by M. N. Srinivas and uh, when he was trying to refer it in terms of uh, a critical understanding, he was basically trying to see in terms of uh, a social life process uh, in a uh, rural setting. And this dominant caste if you try to see in a real sense, it basically tries to speak about uh, the analysis of the hierarchy of analysis of the hierarchy of the specific multi caste village. Hierarchy of the multi caste village and this particular village is to be seen what I mentioned he was trying to speak about is the village which he was which we had studied is the village Rampura where he was trying to see it as a composite unit which com is composed of the multi caste arrangements. multicast arrangements and he was basically referring to the peasant community. Peasant community basically the Ukaligas as the category of the dominant caste and this dominant the dominant caste basically if you try to see the dominant caste is to be represented by this peasant community that is the Ukaligas which are basically seen as uh, having certain amount of uh, land holding, significant land holding and apart from that they are also the controller of the power. And if you try to see the dominant, what is going to be important is that what is a, a caste may be dominant if we have certain uh, characteristics in the mind that is what we have in terms of the preponderance preponderance numerically over the rest of the population. So, the preponderate preponderance numerically is seen as one of the important characteristics to make some caste to be the dominant in that sense and apart from that we also try to see it in terms of the holders of the economic and the political power economic and the political power that is again going to be true when we try to speak about uh, the understanding about uh, the dominant caste. And beyond that certain other characteristics which we try to refer is we try to see them in terms of the education that is they are to be educated. And apart from that we also try to speak about that uh, a caste can be dominant if it is ritually pure. if these characteristics are there basically we try to see that uh, apart from these characteristics what is going to be uh, more important is basically as I suggested oh, Kaligas were the land holders. So, holding of land definitely is a crucial variable when we try to see it in terms of the rural setting. So, we try to find out that uh, the people that caste which are numerically more in terms of number as compared to the other caste or they are economically well off in terms of land holding positions and also having the political power in terms of what one can say the decisive power. 
द पावर विच थ्रू विच दे कैन मेक अ डिसीजन इन दैट सेंस एज सच एंड ऑल्सो वी ट्राई टू सी एजुकेशन विच इज सीन इन टर्म्स ऑफ द मॉडर्न एजुकेशन विच इज गोइंग टू बी एन इम्पॉर्टेंट इशू एंड द रिचुअली प्योर वेयर बाय बेसिक अंडरस्टैंडिंग इज दैट इट शुड बी रेस्ट्रिक्टेड टू द ट्वाइस बॉन्ड दैट इज द अपर कास्ट कैटेगरीज ओनली बट इफ यू ट्राई टू सी दीज थिंग्स वी बेसिकली ट्राई टू सी दैट दीज आर द टिपिकल करेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ मेकिंग अ स्पेसिफिक कास्ट टू बी द डोमिनेंट कास्ट बट द बेसिक आइडिया इज दैट वेन वी ट्राई टू स्पीक अबाउट द डोमिनेंट कास्ट वी बेसिकली ट्राई टू से दैट हाउ वाट मेक्स अ कास्ट टू बी डोमिनेंट इट्स नॉट दैट ऑल द करेक्टरिस्टिक्स विच आई मैंशन are going to be important or relevant when we try to speak about uh, the understanding of the dominant caste uh, he says that uh, uh, either of these characteristics or the combination of these characteristics can lead to make a specific caste to be dominant because if we would have said that that ritual purity is going to make a caste to be dominant meaning thereby that it's only the uh, so called brahmins or the kshatriyas which are going to be dominant always but that is not true because sometimes they are not numerically more so it's not one element alone which can make a caste to be dominant but maybe the arrangement of the different uh, caste in terms of uh, its representation in terms of its number in terms of their uh, location in the political structure and also in terms of the education if we try to see we sometimes try to say that the caste has to be dominant and we try to see that uh, this understanding of the dominant caste uh, which he tries to see in the village rampura he was basically trying to refer to that how this dominant caste was seen as an important arrangement to bring about the order and solidarity in the society because to him since he was a structural functionalist so he was basically referring to that uh, what may be the possible function of uh, what is the possible function of a dominant caste and in that sense if you try to see so as a structural functionalist he says that the purpose of the dominant caste is to bring about the specific order the social order in the society and also to create the or to resolve uh, the conflicts so the basic purpose of course is the resolution of the conflicts so that the society will have the harmony so we try to see that uh, these arrangements have been part and parcel of the village the dominant caste plays a crucial role and this dominant caste is sometimes going to be even over and above the so called panchayats or even uh, when we try to speak about uh, the arrangement in terms of uh, the legal uh, institutions also so the dominant caste sometimes can have uh, the different relationships although we try to say that this dominant caste sometimes is giving lesser chance for the other caste in terms of uh, providing space for uh, their resolution but we try to see that uh, in a specific order everybody cannot be into the power structure so those who are in the power are the controller of the situation and this particular relationship uh, in terms of a dominant caste is been seen as uh, that these dominant caste categories are basically the decision makers of the village now uh, we move down to another important concept uh, which is we try to see is an important concept that is speaking about the jajmani system now this jajmani system i think uh, if you try to see is another important con uh, concept uh, which has been referred by various sociologists especially when we try to speak about uh, the relationship which is there between the different categories especially jajmani system includes what it basically tries to speak about the inter caste relationship inter caste relationship and it is basically seen as a system of uh, distribution of services distribution of services distribution of services that is basically uh, how we try to see the linkage as such like we have the various lower caste various lower caste which may include maybe the carpenters we have the potters 
then we may speak about the blacksmith or we may speak about the water carriers and also we have the sweepers in the village and also we have the iron smith or one can say that speaking about uh, the contribution in terms of uh, what one can say the laundryman that is uh, the dhobi. So, we have the different categories of people who are part and parcel of uh, uh, the village and uh, these lower caste basically they are in a specific arrangements, they are basically seen as the service providers to the other caste categories and we try to see that uh, uh, the relationship which has been there uh, between the different caste, they are basically seen as uh, uh, been reflected in the various uh, arrangements, it is basically from uh, the life to death that is birth to death. Uh, we try to see in the different uh, arrangements, the different caste categories they try to represent, they try to uh, contribute uh, in terms of the service providers. So, we try to see that uh, uh, these uh, relationships uh, are sometimes seen as uh, more stable and they are basically passing from generation to generation. And uh, I think uh, when we try to speak about uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, passage from generation to generation, I think we try to see that it is seen as something which is institutional because it has certain amount of stability it has certain amount of acceptance and it also speaks about the cultural value of that particular setting, cultural value of that particular setting and in that way we try to see that uh, the linkage of the various caste groups is been reflected through the Jajmani system. And the person uh, who can be attached with regard to the study on the Jajmani system is trying to speak about uh, it is W. H. Weiser who was speaking about the Hindu Jajmani system that is the work Hindu Jajmani system where he was basically speaking about uh, uh, the village setting and uh, the village that he had studied is the village Karimpur and uh, in this village uh, what he was trying to see that what is the function of a system of the Jajmani system it is that it is providing all necessary products and services, products and services and the Jajmani system function is to maintain in a specific Indian village a uh, aspect of self-sufficient system, self-sufficient system. So, we try to see that uh, the uh, village which we try to see in terms of the self-sufficiency and it is basically the Jajmani uh, which is going to create certain amount of relationship which is to be there and the uh, services are fixed. Basically, we try to see that the different caste groups they are trying to have the relationship and these relationships are going to be uh, not eternal, but I think uh, they have uh, been continued through generations. But what is more important uh, which we have to see that uh, we have uh, to see Jajmani system in terms of the patron client relationship. And this patron client relationship is basically uh, which has been talked about by Weiser in terms of uh, uh, what you can say Jajman and Kamin. So, we have the Jajman and we have the Kamin that is the relationship which was been there and uh, basically we try to see that uh, the patron or the Jajman they were basically seen as uh, the service takers and the Kameens are basically the service providers. So, we have the relationship between the service providers and the service takers. So, that is the relationship which we try to see and this relationship is not seen uh, in terms of equality. I think that has to be admitted that uh, the relationship is one sided. Uh, basically, we try to see when uh, the service providers are at the receiving ends, they are from the lower caste. So, sometimes they try to have certain amount of subordination and uh, uh, one may even admit that there is a element of slave mentality uh, which is involved 
basically when we try to speak about the lower caste who are acting as the communes and uh, how this uh, system is going to be carried forward uh, Weiser has rightly said that uh, uh, why the people are not moving or leaving the villages. So, one answer which can be given is that uh, although they are been put into that system, but what is more important is that this system is also bringing certain sense of security sense of security basically the economic security or the social security which is going to be important. So, the Jajman are basically uh, seen as the protectors, they are seen as the people who are safeguarding the interest of their uh, communes and that is how we try to see that this linkage is going to be more meaningful. But what is more important is that uh, this sense of security also is seen as uh, leading to certain amount of exploitation because it has been said that once you are into that judgment, so you cannot move away and it is not the question of an individual, it is basically the question of the familial ties. So, it is not the individual alone which is uh, involved, it is basically the members of the family uh, which are basically been seen in terms of a shift. Now, one thing which also has to be pointed out in terms of a specific characteristics of the judgment system is that the Jajmani system is also marked by the presence of uh, uh, one important component that is in the case of Jajmani system, uh, what is more important to be seen is that in this exchange of services, the important thing is that uh, the item or maybe the sort of payment, that payment has to be made in terms of kind. Now, I think this is the crucial characteristics of uh, a judgment system that uh, the payment are to be made in kind and not in cash or maybe it is it can be in cash on demand, but in the ideal situation we can say that the judgment relations are seen where the payments are made in kind that is one characteristics. Second characteristics of course is that the payment is also not immediate, it is not immediate rather it is flexible. So, it is not that the person is contributing and he is immediately paid, it is not like that as such. We basically try to see that when the judgman uh, takes the services, it is not necessary that he will be immediately giving the payment to the uh, communes because uh, that may involve certain amount of uh, flexibility in terms of duration, it can be a month, it can be a year because uh, in the rural setting as we know that uh, if somebody who is uh, basically into the so called uh, produ producing of the crop. So, what he will do of course is he will take the services from the carpenter, from the potter, from the blacksmith, from the water carriers, but he will not give him the immediate return and when his uh, crop is going to be uh, finished and basically when his production is uh, carried forward, then he may give uh, it in terms of the grains or in terms of uh, uh, what you can say certain other things as such. So, we try to find out that uh, the kind is seen either in terms of grain or in terms of cloth or in terms of uh, certain other things as such uh, which can be seen as uh, uh, the important bonding uh, which is going to uh, what you can say help uh, the other group also to get the return. So, this sort of relationship which we are trying to speak about is speaking about uh, the exchanges which have been there and as I said that uh, uh, although it has certain amount of exploitation because here uh, if you try to see the relationship uh, it is uh, not uh, two way, uh, two way in terms of uh, the equality. So, it is not two way in terms of equality, but what is more important is that the relationship is continued and uh, in that. Uh, sometimes we can say that rationality is not involved because when we try to speak about the payment, so the element of rationality is not very much involved basically when we try to speak about uh, the contribution and uh, the important thing is that when we do not have the rationality, it means that uh, uh, you have your own logic, you have your own ways of looking to the things and if you try to see apart from wiser, uh, the other people who have spoken about this issue of uh, the judgment system. Uh, we may speak about uh, the contribution of Thomas O. Bedelman 
uh, who has uh, uh, spoken at length about uh, the village life, a comparative analysis of uh, a comparative analysis of uh, the Jajmani system. That of course is uh, uh, the important work by uh, Bedelman who had tried to rework on uh, Weiser's contribution. And then we also has another prominent contribution by Harold Gold. Uh, who had also spoken at length about uh, a critique of uh, the Jajmani system and trying to rework about the uh, Jajmani system in a new way. Then we have also the contribution by E. R. Leach, uh, who also tries to uh, speak about the nature of uh, interdependence between the different caste groups uh, through the Jajmani system. So, one can say that uh, uh, many contributions have been taken place, even M. N. Shinivas, and for that sake, S. E. Dubey has spoken about the intercaste relationships uh, in their work. McKim Marriott too had spoken about the intercaste relationship uh, in terms of the Jajmani system, uh, which has been reflected in their work. So, I think uh, that is another important concept which we try to see. And finally, uh, the smaller contribution uh, which we try to see again by M. H. Nivas is speaking about the concept of Sanskritization. So, I think when we try to speak about concept of Sanskritization uh, as we have uh, shared earlier also in the previous uh, understanding that Sanskritization is basically seen as a process of uh, mobility uh, which has been reflected in the caste system. And uh, when uh, M. H. Nivas was speaking about that, he was saying that uh, what is Sanskritization? It is basically seen as a process in which a process in which the lok hindu caste in which the low hindu caste or the tribal group low hindu caste or the tribal uh, or the other groups they try to change its custom change its customs rituals ideology ritual uh, customs, ritual ideology and the way of life which is a wider term way of life and uh, this way of life is to be seen uh, in terms of what in the direction of in the direction of uh, in relation to the high caste and this high caste basically is uh, called as the twice born caste twice born caste. Uh, so, people they try to imitate the behavior of imitate the behavior of uh, the so called imitate the behavior of uh, the so called twice born caste and that is how we try to see the changeology which takes place. And when we try to speak about the Sanskritization, it is basically seen as a process of upward mobility that is basically the practices which are being spoken about uh, by the lower caste and they try to imitate the behavior of the upper caste. But what is more important is that when M. H. was speaking about uh, the Sanskritization in his famous work that is social change in modern India, he was basically referring to the changes which are there in the rural setting especially through the process of Sanskritization. And we try to see that uh, this Sanskritization basically is uh, depending upon that what is the local dominant caste uh, which is going to be important and according to the nature of the dominant caste we try to see the different forms of Sanskritization. Like we have the Brahmins as the dominant caste, so we will have uh, the Brahminization of uh, uh, the caste groups if we have the Kshatriyas, so we have the Kshatriyization of the caste groups as such. So, these are the things which are basically being seen with regard to the understanding about uh, the process of mobility among the different caste groups. But one important thing uh, which M. N. Shinvas has mentioned and which has been reflected is that uh, when we try to speak about the Sanskritization and as we all know that the caste system is seen as a close group. So, what M. N. Shinvas was speaking about is that uh, Sanskritization is only going to bring about the positional change in the society 
but it is not going to bring about the structural change. It is not going to bring about the structural change in the society, meaning thereby that by the virtue of Sanskritization, it is not that the lower caste is going to come upper in the uh, strata if he is trying to have the understanding of uh, or if he try to have the behavior of the Sanskritization and uh, uh, it is simply that the acceptance of that particular uh, caste is going to be uh, done in a fairer way. And in that way, if you try to see, we basically try to see that it is seen as a source of motivation, inspirations for the lower caste to have the upbringing and socialization on the pattern of the twice born the upper caste which may lead to the higher order of Hinduization. Although uh, the contribution of M. Srinivas has been uh, criticized that uh, why and how, uh, uh, how the functionality of Sanskritization has to be seen and uh, many scholars have tried to criticize about that contribution. But I think uh, Sanskritization again is seen as another important concept in the domain of rural sociology which we try to see. So, I think uh, we have the battery of concepts uh, which are going to be uh, seen in terms of sociological analysis of the rural sociology. As I said that uh, McEmberiot's contribution of uh, universalization and parochialization in terms of little tradition and uh, great tradition is another significant work. by McKim Marriott, where he is trying to speak about the exchanges which are there between the two traditions uh, which are there in the Indian society. But uh, if you try to see in a very categorical sense, so I think uh, these uh, uh, exchanges between the little and the great tradition speaks about the fact that uh, uh, they are trying to see uh, that how the smaller elements can have the linkage with the wider elements. Uh, the micro having the linkage with the macro entities or the macro can have the limitation with regard to the uh, micro entities as such. So, that is how we try to see the linkage which is going to be there and one important thing that comes out of course is that if we have the analysis of these concept, it will lead to the better understanding about the uh, rural sociology and that will help us in better understanding about the rural society. So, I think uh, friends uh, with these words. I think uh, we will try to see further that how we can have further arrangements and uh, understanding about the rural society in terms of sociological analysis. So, that our rural sociology can be seen as a, a specialized body of knowledge and if you are trained in that uh, field, I think uh, you can have a better command for understanding the rural social phenomenon in a typical sense. So, I think that is all about uh, uh, this uh, which we have tried to speak about in terms of the sociological analysis of the rural sociology. Uh, with these concepts and words, I think uh, let us try to be familiar and we try to with these words, I think uh, we should uh, uh, be more clear about uh, the better understanding about the rural sociology and uh, we may have further discussions in the uh, other units which will be of use for all of you. Thank you. Thank you.